Welcome everybody to the law.mit.edu idea flow. Um, this session is specifically focused on the emerging art and science of legal prompt engineering. The way that you can basically get the most out of generative AI by prompting it. And if you prompt it in a really good way, you get much better results. Um, and if we prompt in a really good way within the domain of law, we can get even better results for law and legal processes. So with that, I'm going to just make a few initial remarks. Um, is this screen coming through? Yep, looks great. Great. As I mentioned, this idea flow is part of the media arm of the MIT Computational Law Report. And this is um, our core team, although we're about to make some interesting announcements with um, some additions to the core team. And I want to just thank everybody for keeping law.mit.edu alive and uh, robust and growing. Um, this is a session that I think you're going to see is part of a theme that is going to deepen over 2023 and possibly beyond. And it's that theme of um, generative AI for law and legal processes. This slide just shows a, um, that we already started reflecting it in January at the eighth annual uh, MIT Computational Law Workshop. And, and we're just going deeper and deeper because the, um, the, the capabilities of this technology, in particular for law and legal processes seems profound. So we think we're just scratching the surface. Having said that, um, I hasten to also caution with a few warnings and disclaimers. Namely, this technology, we must always remember, especially in professional context for using it, that it is prone to false and inaccurate um, in, um, content. Uh, and it also contains any variety of uh, biases and prejudice um, sort of baked within the data set having to do with the way that it's been um, uh, trained and configured. Uh, and in the words of Sam Altman, um, who's CEO of OpenAI that brings us ChatGPT, says ChatGPT is incredibly limited, um, but good enough at some things to create a misleading impression of greatness. So it's a mistake to be relying on it for anything important for now. It's a preview of progress, okay? Um, so just keep that in mind as we're exploring what it's good for and how, and how to use it responsibly. Um, recently, um, the Legal Tech Hub has released um, a sort of initial compendium of places where LLMs are being used in law. Um, I just wanted to mention this by way of setting the table for our special guest, Damien, who's coming up in a moment. Don't worry, I'm not going to keep blathering forever. Uh, but this is partly to answer the, what should be a question in your mind. Why am I here? Is this important? Does this matter? Well, yeah, it does matter. So in addition to our kind of issue spotting, we thought it was important um, in early January. Now here we are in mid, late February of 2023, and there's already a raft of companies in each of these domains that are releasing products and services um, that, um, that use and apply large language models um, in the legal area. Um, and there's many, many more where that came from. Um, I, I might add, where is it? Um, E-discovery was not particularly on the list, but I know that that's already happening. And then Damien uh, had a cool comment on the LinkedIn post where I first saw this, that there's also classification and tagging should probably be an area. And I, I know because we coordinated on this that we're gonna hear more about that in a minute. And I can't wait to hear more about that. If you all don't know about Sally, that's probably the second hottest thing in, in law right now, along with generative AI in my, in my view. Um, so is prompt engineering really a thing? Well, let's take a look at what's happening out there in the wild. Um, there's an amazing prompt engineer uh, position that is um, available at Anthropic. They're the people that bring us um, Claude, which is um, comparable product uh, to ChatGPT. Uh, in my view, it's actually better than ChatGPT at several things. Uh, it's different, you know, ChatGPT has some, some advantages too. If you um, 
look at the, my recent talk to DC legal hackers, I do a head-to-head -head comparison on a long prompt chain related to fiduciary duties between chat GPT and Claude. Anyway, um, open AI is not the only game in town. There's, there's Google, there's others, Anthropic is one. They have a prompt engineering and librarian position. Well, that's interesting. That's a technology company. Um, what, what about us in the law? Well, Allen and Overy, have you heard of them? One of the largest law firms in the world has recently announced a, a, partner, a, a partnership with uh, an open AI funded um, company that has created a domain tailored implementation of uh, GPT-3 uh, plus um, for the legal domain, and it's called Harvey. So they're, they're rolling this out to their lawyers, their partners, their associates, their paralegals, their, their like um, empire of, 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 uh, of, of legal staff, how they're using that um, is going to include prompts. Okay, that's part, so this will become part of like the job description for people in that form or already is part of it. Well, what about like an individual role of prompt, legal prompt engineer? Yep, mm -hmm. that's also starting to happen. So there's a, there is a job posting that um, just hit like about a week ago from, I don't know how to pronounce this. Is it Mishkan Derea? Does anybody know? Okay, I apologize to you if I didn't say it right, but I, according to my internet research, it's a serious firm and they're in, uh, in Europe and they have a role specifically for GPT legal prompt engineer. It's a really cool position. This is just the tip of the iceberg. So I'd say like, this is sort of like just an early indication and it's some validation that this is real, this matters. A month from now, in two months from now, and a quarter or two from now, this is going to be prevalent in the economy. So that, anyway, that's just, this is just an indication, proof of reality. Um, and so uh, the only other thing I'll say is I'll, I'll share this um, on the, I, I've already actually updated the program page for this chat with some links, but um, here's the head-to-head -head comparison between ChatGPT and Claude that you, you, you can look at, you should look at. Um, there's a really nice prompt engineering tutorial, um, which I encourage you all to look at. Um, did my screen change when I clicked the link or is it still on the old slides? Uh, no, I'm seeing OpenAI right now. Okay, great. So this is amazing. This is just a, a very, especially for chat GPT, this is a great authoritative, I'd say, um, high level example of how to do prompt engineering, use the latest model. This is specifically for um, the API, but a lot of this stuff works perfectly well through the chat interface of ChatGPT. Be specific, descriptive, detailed as possible, articulate the desired output, start with zero shot. So we can get into more of that a little bit later, but um, you'll all see this played through beautifully in my view in, uh, in Damien's example. And there's a lot of other stuff too. Oops, there's people who have been already putting tips out there for how to do legal prompt engineering. So I've linked to some of those I've been following with great interest up on, uh, on LinkedIn. And uh, there's some, and then there's uh, some academic papers. Uh, Megan Ma pointed this one out to me, um, teaching a language model to think like a lawyer. There's some great, very deep stuff there. So now, okay, without further ado, it is my great pleasure and honor uh, to introduce our special invited guest, Damien Real. Uh, and he is a big deal, I would say, in legal tech, in my view. Um, eh, I, I feel comfortable just saying a big deal. He's done tremendous stuff uh, with um, not, not just his background deep in law as a litigator, but really interesting technical stuff as well. If we have time, you should tell people about what you did um, with, uh, with music melodies and sort of flooding the field um, algorithmically um, and, and um, basically doing jujitsu on intellectual property so that to prevent others from exclusively owning cool melodies. And he's done a lot of cool hacks and great work now with Fastcase, including standard setting work with Sally, which is critically needed to make the law be able to express itself as data, which is necessary and we're way behind in our field. But what really caught my eye not long ago was a really cool legal engineering hack that uh, I would say legal prompt engineering hack that Damien did where he um, was able to tickle the algorithm in a certain way to get it to actually create a pretty good brief in a litigation context, a context that he knows all too well about. And so I wanted to uh, invite 
you first off to just share more and maybe walk us through um, how you did that awesome hack and what and, and also like maybe highlight the cool complaint that you started with because it's like at a meta level particularly relevant and then I know you have some broader views on the meaning of this and how this breaks down uh, for 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 all of us in terms of our roles and and the capabilities of technology and I'd be happy if you could say uh, your, a few words on that and then we'll open it up to questions we're going to ask people to use chat for your questions and comments so with that yeah. Damien, you've got that's a, that's a, thank you for that very kind uh, intro. I really appreciate it. So a, a bit of my background that might help uh, the talk is that I've been a litigator since 2002. So I litigated with a large firm, Robbins Kaplan, for uh, about a decade. I litigated 15 years in total. I represented Best Buy in most of their commercial litigation. I uh, sued J.P. Morgan over the mortgage-backed security crisis. Um, I represented victims of Bernie Madoff. So I have a large litigation background, but I'm also a coder since 1985. Uh, I'm a, I'm a horrible coder, as anyone who has works with me will know, but I know enough about code to make me dangerous. Um, uh, that enough about code led me to pitch Thomson Reuters in 2015. I said, hey, you should, uh, here's some legal tech that can change the practice of law. You should build it and hire me. Uh, and they were dumb enough to do that. So I worked for TR for a couple of years with 100 programmers and 50 lawyers building this really big thing. I left that really cool job to do another cool job in cybersecurity, where uh, my biggest thing was that Facebook hired me and my company to investigate Cambridge Analytica. So I spent a year of my life on Facebook's campus with Facebook's data scientists uh, and my former FBI, CIA, NSA people that worked with me to figure out how bad guys were using Facebook data. Uh, Monday through Friday on Facebook's campus for about 52 weeks in a row. Is, uh, that was my life for a while. I left that really cool job to join my current really cool job at FastCase and Doctor Alarm, where there's 750 million judicial opinions and lawyer file documents that ha are just waiting to be extracted. Uh, to be able to say what are what are the things that matter and how can I generate new documents based on these old documents. So the only reason I left my cool Facebook and cybersecurity thing is to do the really cool thing that I'm going to be talking to you about today is, is how how can we take this treasure trove of law, which law is all language, right? That's all we're doing. And we are doing a revolution in large language models to be able to manipulate that text. Uh, and so to be able to quickly do that, um, my background as a lawyer for 15 years Plus, my background as a really crappy coder um, is enough to say maybe prompt engineering, that is the topic for this, maybe uh, that's the best combination of those skills. So if you're like me, where you're a really good lawyer and a crappy coder, prompt engineering is maybe the thing for you, <laughs> because then uh, you're going to be able to uh, be able to do uh, do really outsized things that a coder alone would not be able to do because the coder does not know the legal context uh, that it's going wrong. So that's thing number one. Thing number two, uh, because as I asked, uh, my, while I was on the Facebook engagement, we were at a, um, we were uh, having drinks in the hotel lounge. And I said, hey, Noah, you know how you can brute force a password by going A-A-A-A-B? And he said, yeah. I said, what if we did that with music? What if we went do 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 re do do me do do fa, and then mathematically exhausted every melody that's ever been, and every melody that ever can be mathematically, and he said, "F yeah, let's do that." Um, that night, he created a prototype of three thousand brute force melodies. Um, we have now gone from three thousand. We have now made four hundred eighteen billion with a B uh, melodies. Uh, we uh, wrote them all to disk. It, that, those four hundred eighteen billion have exhausted every melody that's ever been and every melody that ever can be mathematically. We've just exhausted the data set, wrote them all to disk. Once they're written to disk, they're copyrighted automatically. And then uh, I put everything in the public domain under Creative Commons Zero to be able to keep space open for songwriters so they don't get eat up by copyright. So anyway, so that's all uh, another hack, uh, right? In, in a, well, in the sense that the law plus technology plus music hack that we've been doing. But enough about these other hacks. Let's talk about legal prompt engineering hacks, uh, which I'm gonna share my screen now to be able to show you. Uh, the idea with this is that um, I know as a lawyer that I want to be able to uh, get things done. And as a lawyer, when I was in a law firm, I would have to write briefs or I'd have to assign a younger associate to write briefs. And so this exercise is largely much like you give a first year associate. I want you to draft the first draft of this thing. I know that you're not very smart first year associate, so I'm going to tell you in very simple terms what I want you to do. I'm going to use short sentences because those are easy to understand. Uh, with those short sentences, uh, it's less likely that you're going to go off on a tangent, right? Everything you would say to a first-year associate are things that you would say to GPT or to any large language model as a prompt. Um, this uh, this is a LinkedIn article that uh, that maybe we can put uh, at some point uh, in, in somewhere so you can read this at your leisure. Uh, but what I thought about is using the table of contents uh, for a brief. 
And so this isn't just any motion to dismiss. Uh, this is actually a motion to dismiss in the GitHub case. Uh, you might know this lawsuit is uh, a bunch of a bunch of does, so a bunch of uh, anonymous coders are suing GitHub over GPT, uh, and it, it Codex specifically is the implementation of GPT. So in this lawsuit, you have uh, you have uh, them saying the coders saying, "Hey, GPT and uh, OpenAI, you ingested all the code that I put into GitHub. Um, all that code that I put into GitHub was licensed under the MIT license or some other license." Uh, See so you by ingesting all of my code, and by the way, all everyone else's code in this have infringed that license, uh, and to be able to uh, now uh, they're fighting over this. I have some strong feelings about this because they're essentially uh, shoehorning a copyright claim into a licensing claim, which is I think not the not the right way to go about it. But this is actually the context in which I framed my prompt for large language models. So um, I took this lawsuit, which is uh, being pulled up right here. Uh, of course, it's not able to be reached. Um, and then I thought, okay, we as lawyers um, already do uh, what programmers call parsing. That is, uh, they'd be able to parse things. And the, what, the things that we parse are called tables of contents. Um, because we as humans know that I have a 50-page brief that it's going to be hard for my reader, that is the judge, to be able to ingest all 50 pages. So I'm going to give them a cheat sheet of all the things that matter. That cheat sheet is called the table of contents, where I, in very easy terms, provide every single argument I'm going to be making in this brief. That's, of course, easy for the judge to be able to grok, okay, uh, I'm going to say the complaint fails uh, for the uh, cause of action. It also fails to stake law cause of action, each of these things. Um, I can then translate that into arguments and be able to, I as a judge can say, okay, they win an argument A, but they lose an argument B. Okay, I'm not sure about argument C. So this is essentially a way to simplify 25 pages. So I thought, what if we take this human curated simplification that is called a table of contents from the motion to dismiss in the GitHub case, uh, and then create a bullet pointed list of counter arguments of that. So essentially taking this human curated argument list and make the counter arguments of that. So I said to GPT, I said, below is a table of contents for a motion to dismiss in federal court. Uh, so this context is important, right? First, you want to set the table. Uh, this isn't just any text. This is a table of contents from a motion to dismiss in federal court. So now the large language model realizes, okay, now I know the context. This, that's what this thing is. Please create a bullet pointed list of counter arguments. So not only did it create, it parsed this thing, but you could see that there's also, it had 15, 16, 17, 18. It created this bullet pointed list um, and where the first one says uh, that uh, you lack standing, plaintiffs lack standing to assert their claims, then the output says plaintiffs have standing to assert their claims. So essentially it's flipping uh, this to be able to make counter arguments based on these arguments. So in this one prompt, it's done two things. It's created a bullet pointed list, jettisoning all the other crap that is in here, right? And it's also created sub lists uh, as well uh, for these things. So now I have bullet points. Next is, okay, now I want to be able to say, what are the elements of each claim? Because you know as a lawyer, I know as a lawyer, and many of you know as lawyers, is that you have uh, you know, breach of contract, which is what they're doing, a breach of the license. What are the elements of breach of contract? Uh, the element is that there is a contract. <laughs> element two is there's a breach, right? Element three is that there's damages as a result of that breach, right? Um, those are the elements of the claim. So I said, okay, my prompt is for each bullet point above, provide sub bullets to provide the elements of each claim. So here are the, is the bullet saying the plaintiffs have standing to assert their claims. What are the elements you have to prove? You have to prove that they suffered an injury in fact. Accurate. The injury is traceable to the defendant's conduct. Accurate. A favorable court decision is likely to redress the injury. Accurate, right? Um, it's accurate across the 50 states. Um, there might be a jurisdiction or two where there might be an additional element, right? Or maybe in a jurisdiction that doesn't require element two, uh, right? But pretty good, right? A pretty good head start. Uh, and it did that for each one of these. Uh, they have, uh, you know, they have shown good cause for anonymity, such as fear of retaliation. Pretty awesome, right? I didn't, that was not, that was not anywhere in my prompt. Uh, and they will not prejudice the defendants, the fact that these are anonymous. Good start, right? So now I have, you know, a bullet list and then sub bullets of each of the elements of this. Now, okay, cool. I want to flesh out facts that would prove this. So as a prompt, I said, okay, now for each level two sub bullet, which GPT knew what that was for some reason, um, that is called an element. 
please provide level three sub sub bullets. Just to, so I figured, you know, just in case it doesn't know what level two is, I'm going to go with level three. Just in case it doesn't know what a sub bullet is, I'm going to go with sub sub bullet. Uh, and then it says, now provide examples of what could potentially be relevant facts which show that the plaintiff satisfied each element. And you can see that this is actually a later prompt because the first prompt included the things that had a lot of medical injury. Uh, and so I said, okay, now exclude facts that include medical injury. Instead, focus on facts related to commercial injuries and contractual injuries, which is what these plaintiffs are particularly alleging. Um, so again, would a, would a coder uh, have known to exclude these things? Uh, they would if they have a legal background, right? Uh, but because if I was a lawyer, then you're able to be able to then uh, may, make a better one. So it says, now, okay, now for, here's this, here's injury in fact. Um, that I have shown standing through an injury in fact. I have suffered economic harm as a result of the actions. I've lost revenue. I've incurred cost. Uh, and then uh, why causation? Uh, it's a direct cause of injuries, uh, but for, right? But for is a very legal term, would not have suffered harm. Uh, and then uh, here's a, your addressability. If, if you rule in my favor, it's going to address my injuries, et cetera. Monetary damages would compensate me. Um, we could go through. But now you could say, okay, now that I have the claims, the arguments, the elements of each of the claims, and now I have examples of facts that could prove out uh, that, um, I want to be able to gather and flesh out those relevant facts from the real well, world. Just one quick thing, because you did it um, for the previous prompt results. Um, would you agree as a as an experienced litigator that these are good examples of facts that would tend to be able to prove the elements needed? Oh, 100 percent. Yeah, these are things that uh, each one of these sub bullets, uh, I would ask my client, what kind of economic harm have you suffered as of this? And then I would get a, an affidavit from them or I would had deposition testimony from them. Right. This is how you build cases. Uh, so when you think about, um, you know, are are these things going to eat lawyers jobs? Um, well, let's think about how I would have done this as a litigator. I would have thought in my brain about all of these things and I would have made a, a list uh, that I would then ask my client to do. Um, that list, if I would have, you know, looked through all the cases, would have taken me maybe an hour or two to be able to think through that list. This did this in exactly 20 seconds, and it gave me a head start. And I might be able to say, okay, maybe it missed a few, but I'm not starting from uh, whole cloth. I'm just adding to, augmenting what the machine does. So this is the idea of centaur lawyering: is that uh, I, as a centaur, I'm faster, better, stronger. Uh, and you know, could a first year associate have done this? Probably not. Right. So I'm a senior partner charging at $1,000 an hour. Do I assign this to a junior associate that would have to turn it around in two or three days? Or do I spend the 20 seconds using GPT to get a, as good as a junior associate and then augment it and get it out the door? So did that cost anybody their jobs? Well, I'm not using that, senior, that junior associate as a senior partner. Right. So it's going to cost that work if I choose to do this. Um, similarly, if I'm a client, say I'm a corporate client, uh, and I want to be able to say, okay, do I call outside counsel, which is going to charge me $700 an hour, they're going to have to find a junior associate that's, you know, it's going to take a week or so, or do I just throw this into GPT and try to get a fast answer and get it out the door, right? Um, the question is not, is it better than humans or not better than humans? The real question is, is it perceived as better, faster, stronger? And even if it's not perceived as better, faster, stronger, um, I just put out another thing in LinkedIn about there is an efficacy, that is how uh, effective is the thing, and then what is the cost? So we think about cost as an x-axis and the eff efficacy uh, as a y-axis. Um, if humans are really expensive and take a lot of time and cost of time, then maybe I, as a in-house counsel, want to be able to say faster, and even if it's less efficacious, right? if it's less effective, but is cheaper in cost and cheaper in time, maybe I go with that a little bit less effective in the form of expediency. So, anyway, so that's that's all a way of saying uh, to uh, to Daz's short question. Yeah, I, I think that this is a um, this is a lot of the things that I would be doing as a lawyer anyway, and it's just giving me a faster, better, stronger start. Perfect. Thank you. So now, I yeah, you mentioned it for the first um, couple of prompts that you you thought it was pretty good, and I just wanted to double check that it was still holding up. So, okay, now let's go forward. What did you do next? So the, now, next, you say, okay, for any one factual claim, I could say, you know, OpenAI's actions were the direct cause of the injuries. Provide factual examples of how a large language model in a training text will cause the author of that training text to lose money. So here, I'm essentially saying, here's the plaintiff's case factually. Um, be able to make give me examples 
of how for each claim, this is proved out. And it says, here's an example one. OpenAI used the author's copyrighted work as training data for its large language model without obtaining permission from the author. As a result, causation, the author lost potential revenue from their licensing work to other companies for similar uses. Really effing good. I go to the client and I say, hey, uh, has this happened? And they say, yeah, let me show you all the ways this has happened. Cool. Here's number two. OpenAI created a product uh, known as Codex, uh, such as a writing assistant tool, Codex, uh, that used the author's copyrighted work, my MIT licensed uh, GitHub data, as training data, and competed directly with my own writing services. I'm a coder, dude. You competed with me, causing me, the coder, to lose clients and revenue. Pretty effing good argument. Uh, I would use that as a lawyer. If I'm uh, if I'm the lawyer, Matthew Butterick is their lawyer, right? If I'm Matthew Butterick, I'm going to do that. Uh, example three, used an author's copyrighted work as training data and subsequently created AI-generated version of the work that is essentially taking my code and just making a version of that code that was similar enough to my code to the original to cause confusion in the marketplace, leading to lost sales of me. It's pretty good, right? If I'm uh, a unique, if my, I have a unique coding style, maybe it's stealing my unique coding style, creating confusion in the marketplace, right? This is kind of a stretch. Maybe, maybe true, maybe not. Then the last one uh, is training data was sold and distributed without providing any compensation to me as the author, uh, also accurate. Anyway, so this uh, this is where I stopped. You could keep going, right? You could be able to say, okay, for this example one, give me some examples of how this, right? So it, the beauty of data science is not question number one. The beauty of data science is what question one leads you to question two, which leads you to question N. So I've gone, I guess, four levels deep on this uh, to be able to do this, but you could imagine um, building out your entire case strategy. Um, and uh, you know, this, took, this entire literally took me uh, less than a minute. Um, so if an associate charges 500 an hour, right? Um, will they spend an hour to do all this? Probably, right? Um, would I, as a senior lawyer, charge 45 seconds? Probably not, right? That's just part of my 45 seconds. Um, but now I'm going to flesh out the facts, right? I'm going to ask my clients, uh, hey, did this thing happen? Did that thing happen? Uh, and, uh, and you know, maybe someday the LLM, I could be able to input my uh, my discovery and be able to say now from that discovery and from these deposition testimony, uh, why don't you go ahead and pull out all the things that matter? Um, maybe we could do that, uh, but that's maybe down the road a bit. Um, but for right now, I'm uh, you know charging the client for validating class uh, case law and uh, doing things. So anyway, so there's you could imagine how this could fit into a pipeline. Say for every, if I'm responding to a motion, input the table of contents into that motion to be able to output all the elements of all the things, to be able to output all facts that it could be using uh, that to be able to prove those things. And then maybe faster, better, stronger. Uh, you can imagine a company like mine, Docker Alarm Fastcase, where we have 725 million judicial opinions and lawyer file documents. You could imagine that might be interesting to us. Say I hit a button to this motion to dismiss, say make counter arguments and facts, and then it could push it through GPT with some good prompting and output uh, our counter arguments and facts to prove those counter arguments. That might be interesting. If motion dismiss, then do the prompt for the MTD, right? If complaint, do the prompt for an answer. Respond to each of these uh, allegations in the complaint, and then for each of those, make a counter argument to admit, deny, et cetera. Anyway, so this, uh, this is just one example of prompt engineering. Uh, there's lots and lots of others. So I guess any questions uh, on this first example before I move on to others? Bravo um, is the first thing. Now, actually, one technical thing. Um, I can't see the chat. I'm not sure what's going on with my implementation. So uh, Wasim and Damien, if you don't mind tracking the chat, um, and if there's amazing or important you know, issues or whatever. Yep. Uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm showing the chat on the screen right now. So uh, question number one is, uh, how, will, how will associates uh, that we train to become seniors if a big portion of their work will be done by machines? Um, that's a fine question. And so maybe, uh, so in my example, I as a senior lawyer essentially did this work. Uh, you could imagine uh, I as a senior lawyer would instead assign the junior lawyer to do this work. Um, this way, uh, so you can almost think of this almost like a calculator then. You know, we teach people to add and subtract and multiply by a longhand. And then after they figure that out, then we give them a calculator, right? So in the same way, lawyers, we teach them how to do this kind of work in law school. But then as a first year associate, maybe we give them the calculator that is called a large language model uh, to be able to then work through and be able to say, okay, junior associate, use this as a head start. 
and then flesh out all the things, you know, flesh out all the facts that I want to show. Uh, and then uh, based on these facts, uh, example one, example two, example three, example four, um, create a list for each of our clients, a list of questions that we ask each of those people, uh, and then uh, be able to then follow up as a junior associate with each of those people to get an affidavit drafted for that. Um, anyway, so, uh, so you could imagine even GPT helping with that. So for example, one used an author's copyrighted work, um, I could input example one and say, okay, for example, one, give me a list of questions that somebody might be able to ask an author of how this might happen. And then it could output those questions. Anyway, so that's, that's uh, all a way of saying that I, as a junior lawyer, would use this as a calculator uh, to be able to train you to become a senior lawyer, not in the way that the senior lawyers were trained, because that was yesterday's law, right? We're training them using GPT, today's calculators, to be able to practice law in a better way than the juniors did, uh, than the seniors did in their day. Um, so anyway, I hope that hope that answers your question. I, I think that today's associates, if they use these as a calculator, not as a competitor, um, will be able to run faster, better, stronger than their uh, their seniors are. Here, here. Uh, well, we can, may, may I just uh, make a quick interjection here? Mm -hmm. um, there's a, there's a couple of things that are sort of uh, between the cracks now that I want to put some some light on. Um, one of them is I think there's more to say about the role of the junior associate going forward. I mean, the first thing to say is we don't really, I mean, we don't have crystal balls yet this technology is profound. That means we can anticipate there'll be a lot of changes, most of which are going to be hard to predict. Okay. Um, that's not going to stop me from making predictions though. So uh, one, one thing that I conjecture might happen is there's going to be a important need for what I would call due diligence and legal assurance with respect to the outputs of these models. So one of the things that uh, you mentioned, Damien, when you were doing a quick kind of on the fly, um, kind of like uh, quality assurance, you're like, well, yeah, this looks pretty good, which by the way, I agree. I think it's amazing. I'm flabbergasted personally by, by the results you got from this. And you're very clever and expert, I would say legal prompt engineering, which is where most of the value was in how you prompted it. I'm flabbergasted that the thing works so well. And yet you also said, and this is the part I'm focusing on for this, this facet of the roles of tomorrow. Well, maybe there's some jurisdictions where there's just two out of these three. And maybe, who knows, has there been recent case law in some other jurisdiction where there's a fourth or what have you? Maybe. Okay. That sounds like a real good time to have a licensed attorney who's um, expert in the law doing a do, some due diligence and then and, and legal assurance um, as part of the regular workflow of utilizing these as inputs to the practice of law, not to mention other, uh, other legal processes. There's going to be a lot more on this soon at law.mit.edu. Why? Because we're going to convene one of our, in, one of our famous task forces. Uh, and the task force is going to be among people who will help to generate um, a set of principles and guidelines for what, at least as a hot first take, we think some of the due diligence and legal assurance types of actions ought to be when, when utilizing this technology for law and legal processes. And then we'll circulate it, get a lot of feedback, but we hope to be constructive and starting to look at that more carefully because we all have lingering knowledge that this, as interesting as it is, it, we can't totally rely on it for everything. It turns out that breaks down into several different types of things, some of which could be put on checklists and some of which involve other types of processes. Yep. A really, a really good example of that is that, uh, for example, uh, you could imagine the large language model saying Roe v. Wade is the law of the land. Right. Right. Uh, but of course, it's not. Uh, and of course, that's uh, I've talked with the brilliant Ed, Ed Walters, my CEO, and he said that citator, a citator is going to be most important for, to what Daza was just talking about. Right. Because the citator will say, oh, wait, Roe v. Wade, upon which the large language model has been based, is no longer the law of the land. Uh, you know, uh, Plessy versus Ferguson is no longer the law of the land. So anyway, so the idea of what is good law and what is bad law, which, of course, changes daily, uh, the large language model 
takes the entire longitude of human history, uh, and or at least as much as it pulls, uh, and is not able to say that now this is bad law. So anyway, so maybe we can build systems, maybe we can, are currently building systems to be able to build that citator aspect of it, you know, maybe this portion of the statute is bad law today. Uh, therefore, if it's trained on or matches too closely this statute, maybe we put a flag up. Um, those are uh, exactly things that should we, be, we should be thinking about. Outstanding. Yeah, cool. Uh, can can, can I give some other prompts uh, that uh, might be useful to the audience? Um, yeah, there was one other quick thing I wanted oh, to just mention, which is in that the open area of like, where's the role left for attorneys? So on this very um, case that you're looking at, fundamental, and this, this really is riffing also off your observation that the law changes and, you know, uh, but the other aspect of the law about what, uh, the other consequence of having a large language model being very backward looking in some ways, because it's sort of the information has this training set, that's all historical. Mm -hmm. um, that it not only might it not cover things that just happened, but it definitely doesn't cover ideas you have, where if you, you if you asserted the idea correctly in litigation and you won, now we've got new precedent. So it definitely doesn't know about that. And so there's this incredibly important role for experienced creative litigators like you and others out there, I know you can hear me, for looking at this stuff and coming up with novel um, approaches. And, and this case I thought was a really good example. So it's your, your, the, what you got from the, your prompts, which again were excellent, was a kind of recipes of the typical stuff that you would ordinarily expect for, for this general kind of case. What's going to happen in this case is we're going to, I think we're going to be looking at new horizons in the applications of intellectual property, partly because we're not looking at literally like a pastiche of, of like, you know, sections of, of language. It's been, it's been atomized and vectorized as parameters and billions of parameters and, and kind of like almost sort of like the Star Trek um, you know, beam me up like it's it's disappeared, but it's come back in a completely different form. This isn't Captain Kirk anymore, uh, and so I think you know there's doubtless intellectual property around it. But this is going to be it, we, we're not going to have novel theories and new ideas. This is another excellent place for human beings. Okay, with that, yeah, I would love to hear more of your prompts. That is, in fact, the um, the the uh, order of the day. And and uh, and uh, before I do the other prompts, I want to augment what you were just saying. And if you think about the um, uh, the role of the human in the, all this process, uh, one role is to be able to count the things that machines cannot count. So, for example, I as a human read the news, and I know that all the senators are pounding the drums of this particular thing that maybe GPT hasn't ingested at this point. And maybe I've talked to the large leaders, the CEO of this large company, who said, "Yeah, we're going to have to be regulated." Right. Um, those are not in the model. So when I was working at Facebook, they would have posters that says, not everything that counts can be counted and not everything that can be counted counts. Uh, so that's an example of what Deza was just saying is that, um, yeah, the machine can count things, but it can't count the kind of side room conversations that I had with the CEO, right? It can't count the news that kind of the way of the wind is turning in one direction or the other direction. That machines can't do well but that humans are things that can do well. So anyway, so that's, I, I think uh, for, uh, and that's part of the prompt engineering to be able to say, if I, if I were going to say, you know, here's uh, as a prompt engineer, if the tables, if the winds are blowing this way, uh, what would be the output? Uh, so I could use my human insight that I got whispered in the halls, uh, be able to then inject it into it. So the machine says, oh, okay, now I know that what was whispered in the halls. So I'm now able to be able to provide even better insights. Um, so with that, uh, let's, let's go to some other cool prompts. Uh, going forward. Uh, so cool prompts as I start sharing my screen uh, is that um, you can be able to extract things. Um, I've been calling this, uh, your, there's generative uh, models where generative AI, tell me a story, write me a poem, right? Uh, and then there's what I call generative extractive models, where I say, I'm going to give you as a model some text, and then I essentially prompt based on that text. So all of this is generative extractive, which is much better than just pure generative. Um, and as a Gen Xer, I, I like to say Gen X, uh, generative extractor. Um, so anyway, so above is some legal text. Uh, from the text above, please extract verbatim text. So essentially saying, don't hallucinate, snippets. Place each snippet into a markdown table. You might not know this, but uh, it, you're able to be able to say, you say, put it in markdown. Uh, extract only verbatim snippets. If you're not sure, do not answer. So again, saying GPT, don't effing hallucinate on me, okay? Below is the syntax for creating this markdown table. Make a column. And then I'm going to give you some examples. 
Within any column, if a cell has multiple snippets, then make it a new row. Uh, using this syntax, below are the instructions for creating this markdown table. Here are some areas of law. By the way, these are Sally areas of law, one of many. Uh, here are industries. These are Sally industries. Here are legal concepts. These are Sally legal concepts. Here are actors. Uh, here are assets, Sally assets, uh, Sally forums, Sally legal entities, Sally authorities, Sally locations, Sally governmental bodies. So essentially saying, here is marketing text from a law firm website. From this marketing text, why don't you pull out all the things in Sally that matter in Markdown? Here are the legal concepts, trademark, trade dress, unfair competition. Each of these is verbatim a Sally tag. Uh, copyright, Sally tag. Uh, then being able to say, you know, actors, okay, claimants, Sally tag. Respondents, Sally tag. IP disputes, check. Uh, trademark assets, yep. Copyright assets, yep. Uh, and worldwide, et cetera. So then here's another one. Uh, so, and then you do the same thing here. So this is a uh, this is not a generative. Don't it's not telling me a story, but it's extractive. Give me the tags of the things that matter and give it to me in structured text. Um, and then you could imagine just running this across all of your data to be able to say, here are all the areas of law. Here are all the industries for which are doing this area of law. Here are the concepts. And because it's a markdown, you could then essentially use it in your pipeline to be able to say, okay, now it's a markdown. I'm going to take all of these columns and then be able to push it into all your other systems. Um, so all of that's to say that uh, this generative extractive is a big deal. Also create a decision tree. Uh, this is something that, of course, uh, OpenAI has decided that, uh, that ChatGPT is just too busy to be able to do it. So I'll see if I can log in quickly. If not, I'll jump over to the production side to be able to do the playground. Um, but one of them is to be able to say, I, as a lawyer, one of the benefits that I give to my clients, at least gave to my clients in my 15 years of litigation, is to create decision trees for them. To be able to say, you know, if this, then that. Uh, to be able to say, uh, this is the things that, uh, that matters. I said, give me a decision tree on whether to bring a breach of contract lawsuit under New York law. And so then here's the output. Decision is say, is there a valid contract? Seems like a good element to the claim. If yes, there is, go to step two. If there's not a valid contract, do not pass go, do not collect $200, right? Has it been breached? Yep. Is it material? Yep. Uh, is the injured party ready to perform? Yep. Uh, is it, uh, you know, it's time uh, passed, right? These are all really good questions. Uh, whether they're accurate under New York law or not, I don't know. Right? Maybe maybe they are. Maybe that that that's the kind of validation. Uh, but it gives us a good start and gives us you know something to edit to be able to give to the client. Now this is the cool part. Express that in Python. And here's Python script that implements this in the decision tree. I love <laughs> right? it. I right? love. It. I mean, that's think about that. Uh, it's important to know that it's only a general rule, et cetera. So anyway, that's uh, use case number two to be able to create a decision tree. Then maybe create code out of this. Um, another is to be able to simplify arguments. Say, you know, here's summarize this text in three bullet points. And then this is what Docker Alarm does today. Uh, we input a bunch of text from a document, and then it outputs three bullet points. And then if it's too hard, you can see this is kind of dense. You can say, make it simpler. And now here's a simple output to be able to take this long, dense text and simplify it. Um, is it going to be accurate? Um, that you could be able to be able to change uh, what in uh, in the playground uh, you could see is temperature. Temperature, if you see right here, this is open AIs where you can be able to put a prompt. So think of it like a, a chat GPT on steroids. Um, the temperature here is uh, if it's over to the right, it's more creative. If it's over to the left, it's less creative and more restrictive. And so then is able to say, okay, I want to be able to uh, not guess, right? This is essentially a, a guess meter, right? Be creative to the right, don't be creative on the left. So what I've done here is to be able to take uh, a count from a complaint, saying this is a, a complaint where they're saying unfair competition. So the prompt that I say is below is an area of law set. Uh, and then I give the Sally data set of all their areas of law. And then the prompt is to assign zero or more area of law tags to the source. I've already defined the source as this. And then uh, return your answer as a JSON. JSON, for those who don't know, is, is a good way to be able to express this uh, as, as example JSON output. And then here's an example of how I want you to express this. Uh, and so then I already ran this. So let's, let's run it again. I'm going to submit this. And you can see here is. Trade dress and copyright infringement is uh, trademark trades law and copyright law. 
It got it exactly right. So now I can just use this as part of my pipeline uh, to be able to say, okay, cool. Now I'm going to tag these things up with the Sally tags, which by the way, are right here. So what are the areas of law? Um, banking law and trade secret, right? So intellectual property law is right here, uh, trademark and trade mess law, et cetera. So I'm now tagging these thing up. And then on the as part of the pipeline, here's the identifier for trademark and trade dress law. Uh, and with the the idea with uh, all of these things is that we're being adopted by Thomson Reuters and by Lexis and by iManage and by Net Documents. So if you say, hey, Thomson Reuters, give me all your trademark uh, stuff, you would send this identifier and then you would send you all the trademark things. You would send the same identifier to Lexis and they'll give you all of theirs. Send that same identifier to iManage they'll send you all of theirs. Send the same identifier to Net Documents, and they'll send you all of theirs. So the idea with this is that these are 13,000 tags that will essentially take the entire industry uh, and then be able to say everyone is speaking literally the same data language, uh, that now we're all able to say, okay, uh, the thing that is called negligent misrepresentation that you could sue me for, if I say something false about DAZA, DAZA can sue me for negligent misrepresentation. Um, now we can all be using the same literal language for negligent misrepresentation uh, because it has a unique identifier uh, that is right as, a, as soon as right negligent misrepresentation. Here's the identifier. All of us, Docket Alarm, Fast Case, uh, Thompson Reuters, Lexus, um, everyone is now able to uh, tag these things up. And so here to give an example of uh, all the companies that are using Sally, Thompson Reuters, Lexus, Bloomberg, Latera. Agileoft, Net Documents, iManage, a bunch of law firms, um, Microsoft, uh, Jason Barnwell is using it, uh, Intel, um, the uh, my employer, to fast case, Dr. Lab, next chapter. Um, the idea, that mostly to be able to prove the point, is you can be able to say, hey, if I if it's hard to extract these things, use large language models as a prompt to be able to extract these tags uh, and then tag these things up in a way that can then be interoperable between TR and Lexis and Latera and Net Documents, et cetera. So uh, that's uh, that's example number two. And I know that we have only 10 minutes left. Uh, does it make sense to jump into chat and questions? Well, it, it does, but I can't I have to, I'm so curious. What what's your next example going to be? Like I hate to leave some amazing thing on the table. Like, did you have an? I mean, if you're if the next one's going to be knocking out of the park like the first two. <laughs> Keep going. <laughs> uh, let's, uh, so let, here's a, uh, they're, they're kind of interesting. So, you know, you could be able to say to the extent that uh, above is a snippet, uh, extract statutes or regulations and causes of action. So it's saying, you know, I want punitive damages. So these are largely Sally claims. Uh, so all, all of these, uh, I would say, is uh, is not nearly as interesting as the others. So I think maybe it makes sense to be able to jump to the tap. All right, good. I appreciate that. Um... Okay, and of course, as usual, I can't actually even see the chat. So, could, could you... so sure. So one of them is how are you standardizing the protocols of stuff in and out? And this is a, a, a discussion slash argument I just had with the iManage publicly today. Uh, so it's Sam Grange, uh, who I, I admire uh, greatly. Um, he says, you know, what's the advantage of going to Sally? And the advantage of going to Sally is there are lots of ways to express the thing that is negligent misrepresentation. Some jurisdictions call it negligent misrepresentation causing harm. So this person's question is, how do I uh, standardize the protocols? Um, and the answer is kind of Sally, right? The thing, whether you call it negligent misrepresentation causing harm or negligent misrepresentation, here's the identifier, the unique identifier that relates to the thing that is negligent misrepresentation. And in the same way, you could imagine that motion to dismiss uh, is a thing uh, that is named motion to dismiss everywhere, except for California, wherein the motion to dismiss is actually called a demur. Uh, so if, uh, if you have uh, so here you have motion to dismiss. Uh, it's called a demur as an alternative label. In some jurisdictions, it's called motion to terminate. Um, anyway, but there, each of them only has one uh, one identifier. So anyway, that's how large language models and LLMs work together, uh, where uh, you uh, you can use an LLM to extract motions to dismiss and motions to terminate and demurs. But then you're going to want to standardize on this to be able to say all of those are actually this one thing. Uh, yeah. What's the potential long-term impact of the IT companies entering the legal market, like prompt engineering software companies? Um, I would say that if I were an IT company, I would be chasing lawyers that could do the kind of prompt engineering that we've been talking about today. Um, but the question is whether Google and Apple and Amazon and Facebook um, see the legal market as big enough to chase. Um, one could imagine that what I've just been describing here uh, in all of these prompt engineering tasks uh, is really good for, say, the US legal market. But if you look at the US legal market, that's maybe $2 billion or something, right? Um, but they're chasing trillions of dollars of market. 
So do they want to chase uh, this? And if the answer is yes, they do want to chase it, then I would be worried. Uh, but I don't know if they want to chase it yet. Yeah, but of course, we, we have some early indicators, if I may. Um, so I would mentioned um, uh, Alan Overy's uh, recent announcement that they'll be um, deploying open AI um, LLM technology. Um, that's not because open AI is, you know, to, in your words, chasing the legal market. What they are doing is starting to um, kind of segment um, to, with um, deals to kind of um, almost like resellers and customizers. Um, and one of those companies has come up with something called Harvey, which is domain specific to the legal profession. So I, I would guess that this is like a deluge and the water is going to find its mark across every industry, even if it's through um, a variety of channels. Um, there's one other thing is I, I've, in, I've invited um, Matthew Waddington, who I've actually never even spoken to in person, but we kind of um, talk to each other on LinkedIn uh, to come off mute if he wants to. Uh, and that's just because he showed a legal prompt that I was intrigued by on LinkedIn, just like, um, I don't know what, I feel like it was a day or two ago. And it, and it was this very creative, he's, so he does legislation um, in, in a jurisdiction and, and he found a way to feed in parts of the law. And then he asked, I think it was ChatGPT to turn it into basically like a decision tree kind of kind of thing. So extract, extract. Um, well, I, I don't want to characterize you, but Matthew, if you're willing to, oh, there you are. Could you just say what that cool hack was? Because it was a, it was a really fresh take on what to do with, with this technology and legislation. It wasn't, it wasn't my idea. It was Regis Riveret, <laughs> but, but he had done it on some French um, and international treaty. So I thought I'd do it on English text with legislation. I wasn't very happy with the results, <laughs> but I was, I was asking it to turn legislative provisions into if then statements. Then. Yeah. Uh, it got, it got the first one, right. Which was a very simple if then as soon as there was an or in it, so it was if A or B, then C, it lost itself. Mm -hmm. uh, whether that whether it was just having a bad day, I don't know. <laughs> hey, instantly, it's great to meet you um, in person, you. as it were, in Zoom reality. And uh, yep. so, but that was, that, I just, uh, thank you for sharing that. That's another thing we should keep in mind. It, like there's, I think some of the coolest, possibly most powerful applications of this technology to law haven't even been thought of yet. So the stuff that we're doing now is, is very important, but um, a lot of people want to express rules as code. And there's a lot of good reasons to do that. And getting a head start on that is another latent capability of the technology, which will improve over time. Uh, okay, and uh, thank thank you, Matthew. Back to you, thank Dan. You. Uh, yeah, there's uh, one. Uh, so to build on what Jazza just said is that uh, people might know Dan Ta Dan Katz and Michael Bomarito. They did a really cool thing to, with GPT to be able to uh, you know rules as code is something that Lawrence Lessig has been talking about since the 1990s, and that's one of the reasons I went to law school because I read his book, uh, Code is Law. Um, but they did a variation on Lessig, that is Dan Katz and Michael Bomarito, to say here is a whole portion of the U.S. code. Um, because GPT knows what uh, a knowledge graph is, that it knows what RDFS is, it knows what OWL is, it knows what SCOS is, um, it knows those concepts. What Michael did uh, was to extract from the US code, here are all the ideas that matter, and here are all those ideas relate to each other. Uh, and he puts this onto Dan Katz, and he announced this about a month ago. So I talked to him uh, a few weeks ago, and I said, how'd you do it? He said, how'd you think I do it? I said, well, I would think of it almost like a word cloud and take the most common words and bubble them up to the top and then see how those words uh, connect to each other. That's how I would do it. He's like, yeah, that's how I would have done it too. But instead, because GPT knows SCOS and because GPT knows the knowledge graph, I said to it, extract all of the things that matter, all of the ideas from this text and express it in SCOS and RDFS. Uh, and it created this beautiful graph of how all the ideas in the US code relate to each other. Um, and so, uh, so that is mind blowing. Uh, but now the other mind blowing thing that we're doing right now is to be able to, now he's connecting all the ideas in the US code that connect to each other. And then is uh, being, able to, uh, being able to say, uh, now uh, connect that to Sally. That is what are all the Sally identifiers that relate to this tax thing or relate to this, uh, this other thing. 
And now we're doing the mapping of the US code to tax, you know, tax ID, tax evasion, and tax law, et cetera. Um, so anyway, so uh, this is kind of an idea of extracting from natural text um, SCOS elements and knowledge graph elements is something that is uh, that is pretty mind blowing. Uh, let's go to some chats in the three minutes we have left. If that is that, unless Daza, you'd rather do something else. No, I, I think that's good. I, if we can at least get one more Q and A, um, that would be terrific. So cool. Please. Uh, so there's a there's a you know young associates uh, essentially saying that they want to be able to figure out how to be a rainmaker. One can imagine that prompting could help that. Uh, I want to chase this industry. Who are particular? Uh, what are some particular roles in this industry that I, as a lawyer, might want to chase because they have decision making capability on legal spend, right? So that's maybe rainmaking. Uh, in Quebec, it says our bar association is very concerned about using the tools. Uh, it's not actually using AI, not a common way. Are there uh, sophisticated tools as uh, legal only? So it sounds like uh, sounds like the concern about AI is largely just not knowing how AI works. Um, so the uh, I would say that any one of these prompts that I've been doing uh, here, um, how much of this is releasing, I guess, client confidential data? Um, not many, right? Because I'm extracting from it, uh, you know, give me things that I should argue. And then the things that uh, the facts that I'm going to ask my clients stay out of GPT. So anyway, so I would say that uh, these kind of concerns, if I'm putting all my client information into the tool that OpenAI might be reading, then I might be worried. But using it as an extractive tool, maybe less worried about it. Uh, right. Legal script kiddies. Uh, yeah, I, I was to highlight that, if I'm, mm -hmm. So I invite everybody to glean from what Damien just said. This is a good practice. So when you're doing your legal prompts, do it this way so that you're not infusing confidential information in the prompt, but you're at a level of abstraction where you're still eliciting the right information. So I just want to put that more affirmatively. Um, thanks. Back to you. Uh, indeed. Uh, the question about legal script kitties, uh, and that's, yeah, script kitty, for those who don't know, is people that don't really know how to code, but they can essentially copy and paste code and then be able to use tools. Um, that's what a prompt engineer is, right? I'm a, I, I'm, a, I'm a crappy, I almost said the S word, I'm a crappy coder, but I'm a really good script kitty. Um, so that, but that actually makes me a good prompt engineer because I could be able to express in legal terms the things that then the machine is able to do. Um, knowing we have one minute left, uh, working in jurisdictions outside the U.S., I'd uh, love to do some experiments. Yes, definitely. TAM and legal. I don't know what TAM is. Uh, devil's advocates. Uh, it's a fool's errand to do prompt engineering. Uh, the simple answer is all this is ad hoc experience system. Uh, and you, uh, oh, nice. Where's possible? This is Thorn. Uh, I love Thorn in so many ways. Uh, we have limited access to the model. The open AI is a black box, which is accurate. Uh, we have no control over it. Uh, and they're probably going to be completely different. Uh, I, and knowing that we've reached the end of our time, agree with you 100%, Thorn. And I think this might be a good way to end uh, is to say that um, the there is no explainability in the things that we've just described. Uh, either it works or it doesn't work. Um, how it works, we have no effing idea. And that might it might work today, and it might be totally broken tomorrow. Uh, because the OpenAI model is closed, we have no idea whether it's going to work tomorrow or not. So all that's to say, uh, maybe a good closing for Daza and everybody else is that um, you know trust but verify. <laughs> maybe don't even trust, just verify, right? Uh, to be able to say, yeah, this maybe it's wrong, maybe it's BS. Uh, and if it's BS, uh, we want to be sure it's BS. Don't trust it. Indeed, thank you. And that, that is a perfect segue. First of all, thank you for taking your incredibly valuable time and sharing what I think is really some awesome, um, I guess, what would I call it? Pioneering um, and creative and highly competent examples of, of what this technology can do and how to use it elegantly and effectively. Um, I, I really am grateful for that. Um, and by way of that last question, I guess we, we ought to end where, where at least I started, which is with the cautionary warnings, which is that this technology is, it is not appropriate to simply rely upon it. I think the biggest risk, because it does so much, it is, is in fact so good, is that we over rely on it. Um, so I think for, for due diligence and legal assurance, what I'm trying to do myself in my own practices and what uh, what I think is going to be reflected in these guidelines that will come up from that task force I mentioned, it would be just what you said, Damien. Start with don't that it's untrustworthy, that it's inaccurate, maybe even that it, it, its priorities and interests and biases are hostile to the interests of your client. So start with that and then work up from there. So it becomes an input. And I think that doesn't, oh, that does not, um, eliminate the role of attorneys and licensed professionals who are fiduciaries. It actually emphasizes the critical need for our judgment and our expertise. So 
With that, I want to thank you all for joining us again for this episode of law.mit.edu's Idea Flow, and we look forward to continuing this series with you later this year. Bye-bye.